Beach, California, uh-huh. little beach town in California, and grew up surfing every single day, and grew up surfing in a polluted Santa Monica Bay. So what would happen is when it would rain in LA, all the storm drain systems just flow into Santa Monica Bay, and we're surfing in this toxic stew. And I was always interested in trying to figure out a way to improve Santa Monica Bay, clean up Santa Monica Bay. And we, here we were in this incredibly healthy sport of surfing, and we couldn't stay well for more than three or four weeks at a time. All my friends, ear infections, sinus infections. You know, at one point, you guys were going in and getting, getting gamma globin shots because of a threat of hepatitis in the water. So it was pretty bad when I was growing up. And so I wanted to do something to improve Santa Monica Bay. So in my first business, uh, I was in my 20s, late 20s, uh, I created some methods for cleaning storm drain systems and industrial sites, manufacturing facilities, removing pollutants that um, would otherwise end up in Santa Monica Bay um, related to a rain event, a storm event. And so I created something called urban watershed cleaning, process called zero discharge to uh, reduce the pressures of pollution in Santa Monica Bay. And won an award from US EPA for the creation of those methods. My first company um, became uh, quite successful and um, I ran that for 13 years and uh, sold it. It still thrives today. So when I look at the kinds of, of businesses you cover and social entrepreneurs you cover, I've really been a social entrepreneur my entire career. That's fantastic. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. So my first business was a, a lot of fun, and, and uh, we won awards, and, and we, we did things that had never been done. Uh, we became the first uh, cleaning contractor to have a joint permit with L.A. County Sanitation and L.A. County Public Works to uh, mm. capture, transport, and pre-treat uh, wastewater associated with our cleaning efforts. And so. Uh, it was really, really gratifying and fulfilling to have an impact on something that was so important to me, which is you know clean water. So it was fun. That's yeah. very exciting. It was so, good. so you started with this company. Yeah. It, it, it was a for-profit oh, yeah, model. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So how how did you make the model work? Well, the mo- the, the first model was quite simple, right? It was you know here were these. Um, cleaning efforts that were going on in any case, but they were going on illegally. So the whole industry was essentially illegal. People were cleaning these facilities and letting all of the uh, pollutants and, and all of the detergents or, or toxic uh, you know, um, materials uh, essentially uh, that, 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 that um, would help clean these surfaces, um, they would just let it run into the storm drain system. And so as a surfer and understanding environmental regulations, I said, wait a minute. Not only am I surfing in that, that's illegal. That's a non-storm water discharge, and that's a violation of the Federal Clean Water Act. And if I came up with a, let me turn this off. This is gonna be continued, this is driving me nuts. Um, So um, so, uh, I said, if I could come up with an environmentally compliant way to do this, I could legalize an industry. I can legalize the industry and actually improve profits. So um, it was essentially, I wanted to create a situation, and you'll see a pattern in the businesses and models that I create. It was sort of like, get legal or get out. If, if, if you're going to conduct yourself in this industry in a way that's one, a violation of environmental regulations, and two, contaminating Santa Monica Bay, you're out. So figure out a way, technically. So so in my situation, I'm not a trained engineer, just as I'm not from the media and advertising business. <laughs> my father is 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 an engineer. My brother is an architect and has quite a quite a solid engineering mind. So I come from a family of people that think like engineers. So I was like, okay, if I could engineer a way to capture those pollutants and bring it back to our facility and treat it to an effluent profile that's acceptable to LA County Sanitation and LA County Public Works, I could come up with a a legal and an environmentally sound way to conduct this business. Business took off. All the leading parking lot facilities, hospitals, all the large buildings in Los Angeles began to use our service. And uh, it was a lot of fun. That's fantastic. So if I understand well, what really made it possible to start with 
was your understanding of the regulations and the yes. laws and what was legal, what was illegal, what they were allowed to do and not allowed to do. Do I understand well that that right, right. we say that that, that, that that was the first step? That was. And well, and also my own personal passion for the fact that I was surfing okay. this pl- yeah. water. I'm like, and so my brain was thinking that way. Like, why am I surfing in this polluted water? Mm-hmm. What is contributing to this polluted water? And then when I started to observe out in the city of Los Angeles, this big sprawling metropolis, I was like, hey, you can't do that. I'm surfing in this. And I went, ah, oh, I know what we'll do. We'll come up with an environmentally compliant way to do it. We'll legitimize the industry. And when I go to these building owners and managers and say, hey, um, I'm going to give you a bid to do this work, but by the way, I'm going to give you a bid to do it zero discharge. And in the early stages, they're like, zero discharge, what's zero discharge? I'm like, well, zero discharge is that I can't let any of this these pollutants leave your property because you have exposure, because you're deemed as the generator of the waste. And they're like, oh. I'm like, so just make sure that anyone else who gives you bids gives you a zero discharge bid. Well, I knew that no one else was doing it, so my business took off. Fantastic. And yeah. what, what, what was the, the, the first reaction people had when you said you were going to do that? I think people generally, I mean, I think building owners and managers want to do the right thing. They certainly don't want to, you know, uh, violate environmental regulations or do anything to contend. I just don't think they were aware of the options. I don't think they were even really aware of what was legal and illegal. I don't think they were hiring these contractors knowing that something illegal was going on. Um, and so, you know, it was part of me exposing folks to like, hey, you do realize that if you do it this way, it's not only you know polluting Santa Monica Bay, but it's also legal. They're like, oh, well then, we don't want to do that. And so, it it, yeah. it, it, it caught on. And and what we did is, you know, like any industry, you know, you can't you can't just charge anything you want for these types of services. You have to engineer it so that it's not prohibitively expensive. And so really the, the, the model had to be how do we do it compliantly and not charge so much for it that folks just stop cleaning because one, they don't want to do it illegally, but two, they can't afford to clean it. And so that's really, the, that, that was really the, 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 um, the challenge and that's where we succeeded is we engineered it to a, to a way that it could be done at slightly higher prices, not prohibitively expensive and um, it was compliant. So, so what I'm really looking for, and you'll see a pattern as, it, as you go through my career, that what I didn't cr- create the cleaning of those types of facilities, I just created a way to do it compliantly in a way that improved Santa Monica Bay and improved the environment, right? So I, it, was just, it was really just sort of tweaking it ever so slightly that it became uh, a social enterprise, if you will. Yeah. Right. And what I often tell young business students is, if positive outcomes are not your deepest motivation for starting the business, there's probably other ways to make money. But when positive outcomes are your motivation, when you hit those financial speed bumps, which entrepreneurs always do, when you hit those financial challenges, when you can't make payroll or You've got some other uh, financial challenge. When positive outcomes are your motivation, you'll go back to the drawing board and you'll tweak it and you'll refine it like I did in my first business. I've got to be able to do this in a compliant way, but I've got to be able to do it in a way that's not so expensive people stop doing it, right? So How long did it take you to, to work that out? A couple of years. A couple of years? Yeah, right. maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe a couple of years to, to actually perfect it. I went through, now, you know, we're talking here, and, and I'm not going through all of the technological go- iterations of, of how the challenges I faced yeah. and how I tweaked it to make yeah, it of course. scale. But you know that took that took a couple of years. But to, to figure out how to do it compliantly was actually something that we figured out pretty quickly. And so I would say, like, because that's always an interesting question. Um, people start social enterprises; uh, they want to, and the question is always, uh, how long should they expect? Uh, before they can say that's it, I've done it. It's successful. What, what? What? How long did it take you from the time that the idea kind of popped into your mind, all the way to the point that you were like, "Ah, oh, damn, we've got a successful social enterprise here." Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you. There's a couple of things. First of all, 
um, not very long in terms of what it took to do it compliantly. But before I realized that it was a very successful business, I really believe that entrepreneurs need to be the last to know. The last to know that their business is a success. Because, you know, it was funny, I, you, you, you're, you're so immersed in it and you're so committed to it that you don't realize that, that this business is building and growing and, and you have friends that are going, hey, congratulations, your business is such a success. I'm like, my business? I, oh no no we we're just we're still we're still at a stage where we've got to reinvest and we've got to we've got to tweak this we've got to make this better we're not doing this well we need to do this better and you need to be the last to know I think entrepreneurs need to be intrinsically paranoid that their business isn't right and that there are competitors you know in rooms drawing up ways to to you know <laughs> defeat you in the marketplace so I think there's something healthy about entrepreneurs being the last to know that their business is a success because you ne you can never take your foot off the pedal that's great I really like that because that that's something I've always felt is that once you get into a too comfortable situation no, no, no. then that's when the slippery slope starts yeah. and as long as like you said you're a bit paranoid oh. you keep on your toes and you don't appreciate yeah. sometimes how much you've actually achieved it pushes you to keep going further well there's yeah there's a couple of things at work one there's this thought that you know you're you know there's competition that will come into the marketplace and erode your market share uh, and then there's also when it's a social enterprise the realization that growth means more positive outcomes so when you slow down your positive impact on the world slows down and that is becomes a different motivation to grow and scale mm -hmm. and so you know when, when I talk to young um, entrepreneurs social entrepreneurs not only do they have the challenge of creating a business that's viable um, but also doing something positive you know you have to really think about it in, in, in a way that um, I'll ask young business students, if we were to implement your business model, would we want to do it forever? I'm like, no, 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 no. I mean, would we want to do it forever? Like when I hear about models where, you know, we can do this for the next 150 years, and I'm like, well, well then what? I'll have grandchildren on this planet in 150 years. So if your business model isn't one we can do to forever, it's probably not that great of an idea. Go back to the drawing board and keep thinking. So when I look at how we're using an environment, you know, we're using natural resources, and we say, hey, we've got a 150 year supply of this, and I'm like, yeah, and then what? You're gonna leave my grandchildren with none of that resource? Are you kidding me? That's unconscionable. So if we can't do it forever, it's probably not a very good idea. And so um, I, you know, can we capture the pollutants that come off uh, of industrial sites, manufacturing facilities, and parking lots, and keep them from going into uh, rivers, lakes, and streams forever? Yeah, we can do that forever. Yeah, that's something we can do forever. So that's got to be one of the litmus tests, I think, you know, for, for entrepreneurs. That's a very, very nice test. That's yeah. a very nice test. Can you do this forever test? Definitely yeah. will remember that. Now, what about what you do now? Do you want to tell us a little bit more about yeah. how you use the power of advertising to, to make social change happen? Yeah. So here's the chronology of it, right? And here's the sort of accidental thing that happens. Okay, so here I was immersed in the whole world of stormwater and urban runoff, okay, in Santa Monica Bay, right? And became more interested in what was happening around the country at that time around stormwater and urban runoff regulations that were affecting the large municipalities. And I began to think you know, the way this is set up, going back to your observation earlier about the education of the environmental regulations, right? Every city in the United States has something called an NPDES permit, a National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit. And that is essentially a permit to discharge uh, 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 runoff into receiving waters, whether that's sewer or industrial sewage or, or, or sanitary sewage or storm, storm water, right, into a river, a lake, a stream, and so on. And in the late 1990s, these regulations were come, becoming more stringent, okay? And 
I looked at what cities were faced with. They had six minimum control measures. They had to have a, a community outreach and education program. They needed to have um, public participation and involvement. There were some construction related things, pre and post construction related things, uh, good housekeeping, illicit discharge, which is legal discharge. These were these, these fundamental uh, aspects of an NPDES permit that all cities had to, to respond to. And I started thinking, and, and cities were complaining about something called total maximum daily loads, or TMDLs, in terms of the types of pollutants and the quantities of pollutants that would go into these receiving waters that would take it from unimpaired to impaired. Mm -hmm. And there was this effort underway to determine what those pollutants were and to start you know, reducing those pollutants. So I looked at it and said, hmm, well, I wonder if we created a program like Adopt the Highway, but we called it Adopt the Waterway. I mean, I live near the ocean, right? We'll put up signs that say, Adopt the Waterway, cleaner cities, cleaner oceans. And we'll have a corporate logo, and we'll have a best management practice along the bottom that says, please no dumping to storm drains, or please pick up after your pets, or these various messages that you get out to the communities. What did that mean? Well, it meant community outreach and education. It meant public participation and involvement. And then we used the actual logo to raise money to help fund those final four, which were more structural. Uh, increased street sweeping, storm drain filters into the, into the gutters and to, to capture, uh, you know, the debris, you know, uh, you know, different types of pollutants from entering the waterways. So I said, that would be check those boxes. If we, if we could get cities to understand that the adopted waterway program could be a way to, to um, uh, uh, comply with their permits. So I launched the adopted waterway program. Now, I got involved in in the effort of going after corporations and linking them to environmental projects, actually through a nonprofit. I started what is Ecomedia as a nonprofit. But what I found as a nonprofit was that, you know, in, in, particularly in a, uh, a sort of a, a, a stressed economy, right, as those foundation dollars and charity dollars began to shrink, all I was doing was taking a shrinking pie and cutting it in more pieces. I wasn't doing anything additive, right? So, um, and, and what was worse than that was that I was competing against nonprofits that I thought were doing great work. So if I got a grant, someone else was otherwise not getting a grant. I'm like, this is a zero sum game. This isn't working. So that's when I went, wait a minute. What if we created an ad model to actually fund nonprofits? And what if we used advertising as a way to grow the pie for all nonprofits. So I turned it into a for-profit and began to look at an ad model, that is television, radio, and outdoor, interactive, all forms of media, all media platforms as a way of funding nonprofits. So at the highest level, Ecomedia is an ad model to fund the nation's most effective nonprofits taking on the most urgent social issues of our time, the environment, health, and education. And so what I was involved in, and you'll see I keep tinkering. Again, I didn't create advertising, right? All I tried to do was figure out a way to uh, harness advertising to have a more meaningful impact on communities and people's lives. And so what's the model that you use uh, to convert advertising into uh, ways to support social change. Well, it was, it was kind of funny. For me. I look at the world um, very differently, you know, sort of in, a, in, in this sort of cosmic way of, of understanding the universe. And I, I, I say this a lot, so I uh, mean to repeat myself about how I describe it, but I see advertising like the sun, you know, in, in, in terms of, of, you know, in the next 60 minutes, more energy will hit the surface of the earth from the sun then we will use as a planet in an entire year. But we, we think we have energy shortages. There's actually no such thing as an energy shortage in the universe. All the universe is, is energy. The questions are, do we have the intellect and the will to harness the abundance that's all around us? How's that like advertising? Well, there's hundreds of billions of dollars spent advertising in the American public. Yet after a 30 second commercial runs, <laughs> Up into the ether, it's gone. The commercials run and gone. You might remember it, you might not, but it's gone. And I thought, wait a minute, 
What if we could harness human energy, human communication, in this case advertising, to actually perform more effectively for the advertiser and have a profoundly different impact on the consumer or viewer? So we're now harnessing the hundreds of billions of dollars. They're going to be spent anyway. The corporations are going to advertise anyway, right? Just like in my other business, these building owners and managers are going to have to clean these facilities anyway, but let's just do it in a way that doesn't hurt the environment. If you're going to spend money on advertising, let's do it in a way that improves the quality of people's lives. What, 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 you know, so that's the sort of pattern, that's the kind of arc that, that exists through, through my career as a social entrepreneur. And so what I was involved in doing was creating three ad products for CBS. Okay? And I was interested in working with CBS. This was prior to them buying Ecomedia. I was interested in working with CBS because they were the only media company. I, I work with communities, with cities and counties and nonprofits. So I was interested in a media company that had all media platforms. CBS was the only company that had network television, local television, radio, outdoor, interactive, and had everything. So when I was building the business, I thought, well, I've got to get somebody for TV, I've got to get somebody for radio. I'm like, but CBS had, had it all. And then we were involved in a joint venture for a couple years before they bought our company. And that's where we began to agree philosophically and strategically in terms of how we wanted to grow this business. And once I realized that they were interested in the same things I was interested in, I felt very comfortable about joining forces with them. And, and it's just absolutely taken off and, and is scaling as a result of, of that philosophical and strategic uh, alignment. And so practically how the model works, you, you, what, what do you practically do? Yeah, so, I, so I'll, I'll explain it like this. I created three ad products for CBS. Eco ads, wellness ads, and education ads. Okay, so through our eco ads, I take everyday ad spends across all media platforms and take a portion of that advertising, and I'll explain in detail in a moment, take a portion of that advertising and we fund solar panels on parks and schools and community centers and low-income housing projects and homeless shelters for veterans. We do energy efficiency retrofits, lighting retrofits, um, plant trees in urban cities, uh, do storm drain uh, related uh, efforts to improve rivers, lakes and streams. Uh, through our education ad, we fund after-school programs, scholarships, uh, STEM programs around science and technology and engineering and math. We fund uh, bulk school supplies for schools. Uh, we fund um, backpacks full of school supplies for kids. Even feed kids healthier meals in schools. So there's a real um, effort uh, to, to help communities deal with the challenges they face around education. Through our wellness ad, we're helping communities take on the challenges of obesity and diabetes and early detection, cardiovascular disease. We're going into communities and, and creating urban parks with the Trust for Public Land and dropping fitness zones into those parks so people can get a full body workout. These are folks that can't afford gym memberships and they can get a full body uh, workout and, and all at their community park. So we're using these three ad products to improve the environment, improve health and improve education. The way it works is this. I go to large corporations, the biggest advertisers in the country. We're going to Acura and AT&T, GMC and Buick and Cadillac and Chevy and Toyota, um, Bank of America, Capital One, um, United Healthcare, fabulous company, um, doing uh, work with top advertisers across the country where um, Hampton Inn, doing some great stuff with Hampton Inns. Um, what we do is we uh, work with them and we go to them and say, look, we're not asking you to spend more money on advertising. What we're asking you to do is to consider spending more of those ad dollars with CPS. And if you do, we will uh, fund community projects that define your brand DNA, right? That define the kinds of initiatives that they're really already involved in. And so they get efficient and effective media delivery of their call to action message, which is let's get people into showrooms to buy cars or to buy whatever it is they're, they're, they're advertising. So that has to, remember, back to my other business, right? 
you still have that fundamental challenge of the reason why companies advertise is because they got something, they got to sell something. And we recognize that. And we've got to fulfill that need. But while fulfilling that need, we also want to be able to carry out the kinds of initiatives that many of these corporations are already involved in. And I'll go to them and say, how would you like to do more of what you're already doing with money you're already spending? Not like, say that again? How would you like to do more with the Boys and Girls Clubs? Or how would you like to do more with Fisher House? Or how would you like to do more with the Starlight Foundation? Out of your ad dollars, you're going to spend anyway. And they're like, okay. And so to get people to understand that certainly there's an ability for corporations to spend more with CBS because we have great programming, right? We're number one in prime time. We've got the best content on television. And we've got amazing reach because we've got a of cross-platform assets. And so corporations say, yeah, I, I could certainly defend buying more of CBS and as a result, these positive outcomes happen in the communities. Can you take a portion of ad spends uh, to improve the quality of people's lives forever? Yeah, you can do that forever. Yeah, just like my first business, you can do that forever. In fact, I hope we do it forever, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's interesting. So how does that differ from uh, non-profits getting straight sort of corporate sponsorship? Well, here's the beauty of it, right? I'm not disrupting the, the 501c3 grant side of it, right? They're getting the grants from the corporations on the non-profit side, and I'm going in and saying, hey, non-profits, I have a whole new funding stream for you coming out of these ad spends. You were never going to get any of this money. This was never coming to you. The corporations are still doing their nonprofit work out of their foundations giving and we encourage that let's keep doing more of that but did you realize that trapped in your ad spends trapped in your ad campaigns right are jobs lower taxes uh, a better quality of life through a better environment better health better education so people are like really trapped in my ad campaigns is the ability to to improve communities I'm like yeah it's been there all this time you just didn't see it and so it's, it's a really, uh, it's a paradigm shift. So it's sort of a tweak. And you know, what we do at Ecomedia uh, is really largely based on the outcomes, right? I'm not from media and advertising. I come out of the public-private partnership space. Most of the people that work for Ecomedia are not media people. They're coming out of the nonprofit uh, area where our teams source nonprofits every day. Right? We take corporate ad dollars that are going to be spent anyway, and we align them with nonprofits that are carrying out um, positive outcomes that align with the, the brands of the advertisers. So we go out and we source the nonprofits, we work with cities and counties, and we then take a portion of those ad dollars and fund those projects. We oversee their implementation, and um, we arrange for third party audit, measurement, and verification of the outcomes. So we don't make any claims about jobs created or taxpayer dollars saved or environmental health or educational benefit that isn't verified. So we're, in, we're interested in tangible, measurable impact, right? You know, it's interesting about how media, I got involved in media and we talked about green media, I'm like green media, what's green media? There's nothing green about media. If it doesn't green, it's not green, right? It's, um, it's gotta be about green memes. You know, it's got to be about the action and the effort, right? So if companies or media companies or corporations want to talk about green, let's, let's get involved in green mean, right? If, if, if you want to get involved in education, get out into the schools. You know, people ought to see what's going on out there in these schools. Some of these schools don't even have school supplies, right? I mean, they're just the basic fundamentals. How are we going to compete as a nation if we're not giving the next generation an opportunity to have uh, uh, you know, a sound and solid education. And I look at it and, and I look at what we're faced with today with young people. It's like when we were growing up, we had to compete with the person sitting next to us, right? Or the, you know, now young people have to compete in a global economy where people all over the world want those coveted jobs. We've got to prepare the next generations of Americans for those jobs. And, and, and let me say, it's We've got some real challenges. And trapped in those ad spends is an opportunity to address some of those challenges. Can it take care of the entire problem? Clearly not. But, but the fact is, you know, 
there, there, there is an opportunity there to direct dollars towards having a fundamental impact on improving education, improving health. I mean, look at what we're faced with in this country, you know, 17, 17.5 percent, maybe 18 percent of the gross national product of this country is spent related on health care, right? Um, you know, if, if we want to bring those dollars down, we not only have to become more efficient in delivering services, we got to become a healthier nation. We've got, we've got to become healthier as, as citizens, as Americans. And so I think, you know, our goal is to try to, to get into these communities and deal with food deserts where we can provide healthier foods into all areas of communities, to provide uh, uh, exercise opportunities to people in all areas of the community. So if you want to talk about green, get involved in green. If you want to talk about education, get out there and do something about it. And the same goes for health. So that's I think that's the reason why the folks at Ecomedia that are involved in sourcing those nonprofits, working with the cities, working with the counties, find our, our work so gratifying and so fulfilling is we're interested in those positive outcomes. Those people that are doing that all day have no idea what kind of media is being purchased by the corporations. They're, they're solely focused on effective um, outcomes, positive outcomes in the communities. And we sort of feel like, in some respects, the outcomes are a lot like content in the media world. As long as we, Ecomedia, carry out you know, uh, you know, positive outcomes effectively in these communities, corporations, we feel, will want to be aligned with those positive outcomes. And so just like CBS is number one in prime time because they produce the best content, right? If you have the best content, you'll attract the right audience. If you produce positive outcomes, you'll attract an audience of, of corporations and advertisers. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Paul. What is the best way if people want to get in touch with you, connect with what you're doing um, or anything else? What is the best way for people to to support what you're doing and connect. Well, you can certainly learn more about Ecomedia at www.ecomediacbs.com. So www.cbs, no, no, ecomediacbs.com. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for spending your time and sharing your thoughts. What a pleasure, thank you. Mm -hmm.